All right, welcome to Unit 9, lecture, whatever the hell this is now, 9, 10. We're sitting at week 12, so at least we know when we are. Um, this unit's about function and triggers. Historically, this used to actually be a big part of this course, and it's been slowly pushed off to the side because the other profs don't find it as important, so I'm not going to cover it in, for three and a half weeks like I used to. However, it is an important set of topics to know about because as cool as databases are when you're selecting stuff out of it, when you are actually able to programmatically change the behavior of the database, that's even cooler. Now, basically, I'm going to discuss user-defined functions and triggers. Now, by now, you guys should know what a function is, right? Do you guys know what a function is? Okay, same ideas in Java, syntax is different. It behaves roughly the same. Now, there are three kinds of programming possibilities when you talk about programming a database. Now, so every time you say, oh, I was programming the database, I was typing SQL statement. No, you were having a conversation with the database. Programming the database means you're creating your own functions to do stuff that isn't built into the server. Or you could create stored procedures, which allows you to execute a bunch of commands for maintenance purposes. And you can create called something called triggers. And I'll be getting into that in a bit more detail. Um, most database servers offer a couple of languages for triggers. Oracle offers one. MySQL offers one. Actually, no, Oracle's is called uh, PSQL. Uh, I think they now let you tack on Java, but it kind of sucks. MySQL has something called runtime. Microsoft SQL Server gives you the choice of either transact SQL or C Sharp. Except when you run the stuff in C Sharp, it loads the CLR every time. So not necessarily a, a CRL, the common runtime libraries. It's not always a good thing. Postgres, on the other hand, but out of the box offers PGSQL, which is 90% compatible with Oracle's. Tickle which is a dead language. Perl, which I wish was a dead language. And Python. So you can write your, your functions, your stored procedures, and your triggers in these four languages right out of the box. Um, it also supports, I think later on in the slides I cover these, it also covers PL Java, PLC, PL PHP, PL Bash. Uh, last time I checked, there's 20 different programming languages you can use with the database server. It is uh, pretty damn slick, actually. It covers absolutely everything you could ever want. Oh, the coolest one of them all. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a couple of people in here that have taken stats, right? Anybody here ever use R? There's a language for stats called R. There's a stats language for Postgres called PR. So you can actually use R functions for stats math. Uh, oh, and there's also one other one that makes a lot of people excited, uh, PLCUDA. You can actually get your database server to use your CUDA course on your NVIDIA card to do math. So you can get your database server to start cracking passwords. Or bit mining, Bitcoin mining, if you don't want to be really on meltdown your PC. Okay, functions versus stored procedures. In Postgres, up until version 10, kind of, but definitely in version 11, they were the same thing. There was no difference between a function and a stored procedure. Now Postgres have accepted the fact that there really needs to be a distinction between the two, so they've created a distinction between the two. And they now have, they follow the same rules as the following items. A function returns a value. Your voice carrying well. A function returns a value, right? Even in Java, it returns something. Even if you return a void, technically void is still a value. You're returning, you're telling it that the value returning is no value. A stored procedure does not return a value. In other words, it runs and ends. A bit like a batch file. Or a program that you wrote and when you quit the program, nothing comes out. Congratulations, it's a procedure. A procedure is a set of commands. Well, so do functions. Functions are 
a set of commands. However, their purpose in life is slightly different. A function should not alter the structure of the database. A stored procedure may alter the structure of the database. Now that they've started delineating functions and procedures in Postgres, they're starting to enforce the basic rules between the two sides. Uh, before, they weren't enforcing the rules. Um, normally, essentially, a function is you use it to, to ma manipulate your data. So you create a function to generate a password, a function to roll dice, a uh, function to randomly generate some weird set of numbers, whatever. Uh, maybe a function to strip out special characters out of a string. But a store procedure could clean out all the log tables. It could do log rotation. Uh, it could create segments so that when you're doing horizontal partitioning, it could create a fresh partition and rename the other tables to match out the proper set of partitions automatically once a month. It's basically jobs that run offline. All right. So the language that's associated with Postgres, and it's basically put, if you try to do lab 10, this will be important to you. Um, PGSQL is a single purpose programming language unto itself. Now, who here knows the difference between a general purpose language and a single purpose language? Anybody here can take a guess. Your first hand to move was there. Yes, that's exactly the difference. Java, you can write almost anything in it. C, you can write pretty much anything you want in it. Assembly, you can write whatever the heck you want in it if you're brave enough. On the other hand, PGSQL serves one purpose, only one purpose, is to interact with the database. This applies to Transact SQL for SQL Server. It applies to runtime for MySQL. Those languages are made specifically work for working with the database. If you use some of the outside languages, such as Python or C Sharp or whatever else, there's overhead that comes along for the ride. You can do more with it programmatically. However, it comes with overhead. Even if you call in a PL Python program, it actually calls external Python interpreter, kind of. It actually loads it in memory and executes it part of the runtime of the query. So you're adding overhead every single time you run it. So the first important thing when you think about PLPGSQL, which is the same for oracles, is the assignment operator. What's the assignment operator in Java? Equal. Right? The comparison operator is double equals. Now, what's the comparison operator in SQL? Single equal. So how can it be the assignment operator? Somebody said, oh, snap. So they said, we'll call it colon equals. And they're going, man, you know, we need to base ourselves on a language everybody's seen at some point in their lives, not realizing that none of you are going to actually see this language that it's based on. And when I, in a minute, I'll talk about where th the history of it came from. Instructions are semicolon terminated. Surprise. Just like every other uh, programming language, pretty much, other than Python, semicolons at the end. C Unless you want a loop. Uh, conditional use of if, then, else if, else, and end if. It looks a lot like basic, if you've ever seen the language called basic. It has for loops and while loops. So everything you guys have learned in Java exists inside of this. Wow. Find all the basic programming structures you've learned. Your conditionals are the same. Your loops are the same. The syntax is different. But the concepts are the same. And that's the very most important skill set you can learn this early on, is adaptability. Once you learn the core concepts of one language, all the other languages are the same. Now, I've provided a link to the language reference. Before I go to the next one, P uh, Oracle's programming language and Postgres's programming language is based on a very old language that's been around for a long time. Not as old as Basic or Fortran. It's based on the next generation languages that came out after that. Anybody here ever hear Pascal? Okay, a couple of hands, a couple of faces went, eh. This is a lot like Pascal. 
Variables must be declared at the top, otherwise you can't use them, and they have to be included in a declare block. Yeah, you cannot do the good old, oh, I need a new variable here. I ain't he, I'm a tool equals random. Round it up, right? You can't, actually that wouldn't work because it's an IT and a random was to float, but anyways, whatever. In Java and most general purpose languages, you can declare a, a variable anywhere you, t where you need it. With this, you have to declare them at the top. And if you didn't declare it, you can't use it. Very strict, which allows it to be very efficient because it knows what it's expecting. Okay, we need to find a function. Let me, s tell me if this sounds familiar. There's a create function command. You define the name. I actually do have an example coming up. You define the arguments of the data types and defaults if applicable. You define the return type. You define the variables in the code, return value, end code. That pretty much sounds like defining a function in any given language. That's all the major pieces of defining a uh, function. Here's what it looks like in Postgres. And this is what it would look like in Oracle, just so you know. It does not look like this in MySQL or um, MySQL server. So create a replace function. By the way, replace does not work if you change the argument, number of arguments. So you have to drop it. Create or replace. This is going to do um, a roll, a dice roll. Two arguments. They're both integers. Number of sides for each die and how many times it's rolled. It returns an integer. So if we were doing the equivalent for Java, actually, I don't even know how to write it in Java, but anyways. And PHP doesn't have return types. <laughs> So what is different, though, is you'll notice the two do the double dollar signs. The double dollar signs is called a code block delimiter. It's the magic sauce. You can actually make, it doesn't have to be double dollar signs. It could be dollar sign, begin, block, dollar sign. It doesn't care what's between the dollar signs. Yes? Uh... Yeah, no, not quite. This is a little different. Um, it's not a tag per se. What that double dollar sign is doing, or whatever it is dollar sign something dollar sign, as long as it's two dollar signs, say it's telling it until you see another set of double dollar sign, ignore semicolons. So as you can see, there's a bunch of semicolons in the code. What it's doing is it's saying until you see the next double dollar signs, ignore semicolons. Because if that wasn't there, which you can write a function, if you didn't have that double dollar sign, it would, the code would end at declare total int. And it would say, oh, you're done. Congratulations. It does nothing. There's no curly braces in this. It is, it is as if you could tell C to stop ignoring the semi, uh, Java. For the next 10 lines, ignore semicolons. Treat it all as one giant command. That's what the double dollar signs is doing. It's telling it, ignore the command terminator because this is all one thing. You're going to take this one thing and you're going to put it in the database, compile it. So then when we try to run it, it either works or blows up. Yeah. Yeah, what a... Yeah, I'm going to get to that line. I haven't gotten there yet. I was explaining the double dollar signs. All right, so I'm done with the double dollar signs. The next line after that, you have a declare total int. Remember I was describing how you have to declare your variables? That's your declare block. You have to declare all your variables that you're going to use. Now some of you are going to say, hey, but what about I? I is weird. Not me weird. That's weird. The next thing you'll see is begin with a matching end. This is, so Oracle's language and Postgres's language is known as a code, a code block level language where you can nest code blocks. You can choose to ignore entire blocks of code if you want to and you can jump between blocks of code. You can name them and jump between them and treat them as sub-procedures. Sub it's a little excessive, but there are people that use it because it can, they do use it. But basically put, 
your procedure has to have a begin and an end. Everything happens in between those two. Everything before that is icing on the cake to make sure the cake it looks pretty to the job. So I'm assigning total to zero. Once again, there's that lovely colon equals. Total is equal to zero. For I in one, two dots, number of dice, loop. Okay. This is like your for loop that you're used to writing. And at least this is one I can write in any language. Well, I'm going to write it in PHP, but it's going to be the same. That's your standard for statement. If I want to do this in Java, I'd do this. <laughs> Essentially. Ignore the dollar signs. That's a standard for loop. That line you see there is doing the exact same, th same thing. Actually, it's number of dice instead of number of rolls, but you get the idea. Essentially, what it's going to do, it's going to loop the number of dice you fit in through the, uh, the, the command line argument at the top. Number of dice is here. It has to be at least one because I'm not giving it a default value. That means if you don't provide it, it's going to blow up. Now it's going to go from one, and I'm not checking, I'm not doing bounds checking, and it's going to loop. So the next thing that happens is total is equal to the total plus, which is how you'd probably do it in Java anyways. Yeah, you could use the short code, the short version. Plus equal is actually translates into total equals total plus. Same difference. PHP's got the same thing. So total plus, and then I'm just doing some math. I'm rounding, I'm multiplying random times number of sides, adding one. Because then when you roll a die, when you do a random, it, you could end up with a number that ends up being zero when you round it. So you always want to add one. So total equals total plus that. That's actually stuff you should be able to do in Java just fine. It ends the loop. So that's the same as the end curly bracket. I return my total. I end my code. I end my double dollar signs. And then there's another line you've never seen in any other program language called language. Language is PL, PGSQL. In other words, I'm telling it that the code in here between the double dollar signs is written in PGSQL. If I wanted to write that in Python, everything between the double dollar signs could be Python instead. Or it could be Perl, or it could be Java. It runs the, it loads the runtime every time it fires a trigger. So, Dad, yeah, don't do Java. You can. I just don't recommend it. Yeah, if you really want to get fancy, um, actually, there is one quirk also that about Postgres when it comes to Python and Perl. They are installed as trusted languages. That means that they live inside itself, but you can install it as an untrusted language, which means it can then do system calls. I once wrote a, a function that when it ran, it would actually open up a port on another server and transmit a file. Because I could. Or you could get it to, when you delete a database record, reach out to the disk and delete the matching file. So you get the database server to actually do file management if you want. Not that I recommend it, but you know you could. It'd be very efficient, actually, if done properly. Okay, so the next one is triggers. Now, functions you guys understand. I'm not even talking about procedures because essentially a function and procedure is the same thing. However, triggers are different. Triggers are what's called event-driven actions. It's event-driven programming. Now, you guys all look at event-driven programming and you haven't learned any of this yet. When I was in school, event-driven programming was the new thing on the horizon where it was just coming out. I actually paid extra to take an extra course at night so I could be at the edge of the, at the forefront of event-driven programming. I learned Visual Basic 2. No, 3. Yeah, it was a big jump from 2 to 3. We went from 8-bit to 16-bit. Um, now, the thing is, I hear all these mice clicking, 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 and I'm sure there's three people in here playing Overwatch. 
but you know, click, 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 click. You're firing off events. So, for example, how many events do you think fires off when you hit, you click on an OK button? So you have a variety of possible events that fire off when you click on an OK button. At a bare minimum, you'll have a mouse down, a click, and a mouse up. On the other hand, you have the option for click, double click, right click, right double click, middle click, click and hold, shift click, control click, control shift click. That's just for an OK button. So essentially every time you click on something on the computer, you're firing off an event. Every single time, if you move your mouse, you know you go to a web page and you move your mouse over a field and the field glows to pay, maybe you should pay attention to this. That's an event, it's called mouse over. When the field loses focus on a web page, it's called uh, blur. Why? I don't know, they called it blur. It's better than lose focus, I guess. So those are events. They're points in time when certain things happen. Now, with database servers, there are six moments in time that can be captured. And they are, and I gotta be careful because I'm saying most. Some database servers have more. Like at a minimum, if they support triggers, they all support these six. And these are the six that are used most commonly. And they, you have the choice of before or after an event. So those are your two points in time. Before the event, and after the event. And what are the three events when you frig with the data? Insert, update, and delete. So if you have a before insert and an after insert, a before update and an after update, and a before delete and an after delete, that's six events. Depending on the database server, the trigger may or may not be part of the transaction. So by that means is you issue an insert statement. Postgres treats the moment you issue that command is a single item transaction. Everything that happens, happens at transaction block. If anything goes wrong, the whole thing, it's like it never even happened. It gives you an error and says, you suck. Other database servers like MySQL will allow the first trigger to go and if it worked, great. Then it'll try to do the insert, great, that worked. That the after trigger fires off and fails, that's okay, the rest of it still gets to exist. Which is why you never use MySQL for financials. You can't trust it. So there's also a trigger flow and available data. So when the triggers fire off, there's two, there's a set of events and there's two data structures that get created and they may or may not exist depending on which event you're dealing with. And I'll actually discuss those in a minute. Um, there's new. New is the data being pushed into the database. New exists for inserts and updates because you're adding or changing something to an existing database. You're pushing data into the database. However, new does not exist for a delete because you're not adding anything to the database, so new will not exist for delete. On the other hand, you have old. Old exists for update and delete. If you're inserting, there's nothing there before. Therefore, there's no old data. However, when you do an update, old exists. And when you go to delete something, obviously the old data is there before you blow it up. Now, therefore, it exists there. So there's a flow chart, and I'm gonna go through the flow chart, then I'm gonna do a two second demonstration, and it's good because I got five people right at the front I can use as my guinea pigs. It's fantastic that five of them decided to sit there. Actually, I really need four, but I'll probably find something for uh, dude at the end here. All right, so whenever a, tr a triggers fire off, this cute little flow chart, and that should be available on Brightspace. It is on the slides, so you can go suck it down, look at it at the slides if it's too small on the screen, because it is too small on the screen. Okay, SQL command is received. That's a nice little circle at the top left. It goes down and makes a decision. Is it a manipulation command? Yes or no? If it's not a manipulation command, it executes the query, returns the results, and says, hey, congratulations, you're done. It, is it manipulating the data? Is it an insert, update, or delete? It checks to make sure the command is valid. Later, boys. All the good exam material will be in about five minutes. I love calling people out when they leave early. I don't even feel offended, I just like making fun of them. 
Whatever. I'm going to give you answers to the exam and not record it. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Cut that out. No, I'm not even going to cut that out. So it parses the query. Make sure the query is parsed valid, as in there's no syntax errors with your query. So nothing wrong with your insert, update, or delete. Then it goes and says, oh, is there a before trigger? Is there something I should do before I apply this to the database? If there is, it runs whatever magic code. And then if it, that succeeds, it runs the actual insert, update, or delete. Did that succeed? Yes or no? If it did, it goes, is there something supposed to happen after the fact? Yes or no? If there is an after trigger, it runs that too. If it finishes, congratulations, it all ends. At any point in all of this, if the answer was no, it bombs out and gives you an error message. So yes is, oh, there's a before command. Yes, I'm going to run it. Oh, it ran. I'll update the data in the database. Yay, this is good. And did it work? Yes. OK, I can end. All right. Now, talking about the data flow and how it all behaves. So earlier, I talked about Okay, so these are when certain things are available. Now, a lot of people wonder, why do you need the new? Why would you need the new data that's being shoved into the database? Because you can actually change it before it gets applied. So if you have a before trigger, you can modify what's actually being inserted into the database with your own values. And then apply it to the database. And then, But if it's already been applied to the database, so the after trigger cannot modify the contents of the database. The before can. OK, so I need a piece of paper. Somebody got a piece of paper? Oh, that'll work. There you go. We're good. Oh, that's notes. Oh, that's even better. Oh, no, there. I'll take it. It's good. OK. I've got to plan this properly. Hold on. You get this. You get my marker for a second. OK? So what's going to happen is I'm going to tell you a word. You're going to tell the word to him. Y Actually, no, he's got to have it. He's going to, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to tell you a word. You're going to tell it to him. You're the before trigger. You're going to change the word to something else. And you're going to tell him. And then it's going to be your turn. Cat. Write down the word dog. I'll, I'll wait till you have your turn. OK, now give him the paper. Keep the marker. No, you keep the marker. Change that to something else. Exactly. You're the after trigger. You're the before. He's the query, the before trigger. Did the act? No, he's the one that actually applies it to the database. You're the after trigger. Now give it to him. Did you get it? Did it come to you? OK, good. You're the end, resu you're the end result. OK, so one more time. You got the paper. This time you know what's happening, so it's not as embarrassing. What's going to happen, he's going to be the query. He's going to push in the new value into the database. The before trigger will change it to something else. So for example, you could be changing the date to something else. He's going to actually apply it. So it's gonna, the transaction is actually going to be applied to the disk. And then the after trigger is allowed to see what's been applied, but you can't change it because it's now written to the disk. And then dude at the end tells me whether or not it actually made it to him. Yeah, you could actually do a seg fault and pretend it never made it to him if you want to demonstrate that. Red. Red. 
just put the letter B. It's good enough. Now give it to him. Keep the marker. Can you do any? No, you're not allowed to change it. But if you wanted to, you could say, oh, you know, I don't even want to deal with this and take a sh and then take a fit. Then he has to, and then he goes, instead of passing it to him, you go, you give all that back this way. It all goes back that way like it never even happened. It goes back to there. And what do you, dude, did you get, did you get it? Max. Bro. Okay. Max, did you get it? Okay. Do you know the only one I know in the whole row is Dante? I'll do well to remember. I just don't remember why I remember Dante's name. No, not really. <laughs> so essentially that's what I'm talking about, the lifetime of the data during a, a trigger. Is if it's a new, you can modify it, but only until it hits the database. Once it's been written down, it's over. You're done playing with it. You can still do stuff after the fact, looking at the values that were passed in, but you never knew what the word Dante said. Like you never, you had no idea what Dante said. You only know what dude here said, whatever his name is, with the earphones. <laughs> yeah, Kevin. So you know what, you only know what Kevin said, not what Dante said. So that's the lifetime of the data inside of a trigger. If you didn't change it, then you'd know what Dante said. All right. He's boat anchor because of his laptop. Okay. Postgres specific stuff. So Postgres has both regular triggers and event level and or global level triggers. Regular triggers are attached to a single table and they capture only the DML changes. Event triggers are global and they can capture DDL. The, the, in other words, it can actually capture the fact that a table was created or a table was truncated. So there's actually such a thing as after table create, do this. I've never seen the use for them, but that doesn't mean somebody out there hasn't found a good use for them. Apparently SAP abuses these kinds of things excessively. Now, their triggers are a two-part item. Postgres is the only database that are like this, that is like this. I might be wrong. Things evolve. But in Postgres, triggers are a two-piece item. There's a function. So remember I was talking about creating functions earlier? There's a function, but it must return something called a trigger. So it'd be returning an int or returning a date or returning a var card, it returns a trigger. In other words, it's actually moving the data structures from the insert statement between one piece to the other. And then there's the actual trigger that calls the function. Now, there's some advantages to doing this way. You can create a single function and share it across multiple triggers. That means if you find a bug, you modify one function and all your triggers get the updated version. With MySQL, you must have the code defined completely inside the trigger. That means if you're using the same trigger code in 10 places, you have to update the database 10 times. And what happens if a transaction fires off halfway through while you're doing these changes? Once again, don't use MySQL for financials. Just saying. Okay, I included the create tables, the create trigger syntax here. Just that's literally a copy paste right off the Postgres site. Okay. Here's a function that returns a trigger. It looks fairly similar as the uh, to the other one we had before. As you can see in this time I've got dollar sign body, dollar sign instead of just double dollar sign, just to demonstrate the fact that you can use whatever you want as long as it starts and ends with dollar sign. Now, if new dot dongle serial is not equal to old dot dongle serial. In other words, you can use the new data and the old data to compare values against each other saying, did this field change during the update? And if it did, I'm gonna set a timestamp to know when the serial number last changed. I'm actually firing off an insert statement into a log table. So this is an after update trigger. After the trigger is updated, the data is updated, it will insert an entry into a log file with the old dongle number, 
the old cereal and the new cereal so that we know what it was, what it became. And then it returns new <coughs> because it has to return something. And new is a trigger data structure. Now, there's a bit of history behind this one. And I'll be giving you guys the story to this one because this one is one of my proudest moments not. Part two is the actual trigger definition. Create trigger, whatever the name of the function was, before update on dongles or after update on dongles, whichever case you want it to be. This one's before update because it's setting the serial number, uh, the timestamp. For each row. Now that line is optional. For each row. For each row means that for every row that's being updated, it will fire off the trigger. So if you're updating a thousand rows, it'll fire the trigger 1,000 times. If you don't include that, it'll wait till the whole transaction block is done and then fire it once. Or it'll fire it once for the entire transaction block. So that means it'll fire it once, do 1,000 updates, and end. For each row means it'll, update, it'll fire for every single row. So to explain what's so valuable about triggers. Now, the company I work for during the day we use something called dongles. You can always ask Nick. He did a co-op in high school with us. And he's got his earphones in, so I've been, I've been talking about him. He has no idea. This is the best part. We're all looking at him, and he has no idea we're talking about him. <laughs> and he goes back to watching his video. That's great. <laughs> Anyways, so where I work, we use dongles, hardware locks, for the software. Because, you know, our software is a little expensive. It's not like... It's not like $300 software. Actually, the cheapest package we sell is 300 bucks. The top end package is 1500 to 2500 bucks, depending on what options you pick. It's expensive software. And years ago, well, this is about eight years ago, while I was taking a, let's say a sabbatical from that, that current employer and was working for another employer for a few years, that was just life. I didn't get fired. I chose to leave for a while, as did a bunch of other people. Uh, with the great, with good wishes of the company. It wasn't a, like a harsh parting or anything. I was working somewhere else. And I get, but I was on contract to provide support for some of, the, some of these systems because they didn't want to replace anyone at the time. I get a call in a panic at 8 a.m. Dan, Dan, what? Dongle, num dongle serial numbers are changing at random in the database. Really? Why is that? We don't know. So, after some investigation, we discovered that I was going to ban the entirety of the Netherlands from our web server. That was number one. Um, number two, we also discovered we we're going to ban every Tor exit node, which is really easy to do. It's a simple five-line script that updates your firewall every five minutes. And anybody coming off Tor cannot access our registration system. What was happening is we had some tool coming out of the Netherlands. We can't say he worked, he lived in the Netherlands. He was exiting through an anonymous proxy in the Netherlands. And he was hammering our registration system, feeding in random data into the fields. But the thing is, there was a pattern to his random data. Because all the stuff that's tied to the, hard, to the hardware locks is encrypted in a file. How do you break encryption? Well, yeah, but how, that's called decrypting. How do you break the encryption? You feed known values into the file. So if you know you're feeding in one, two, three, four, five into a given field, and then you feed four, five, six, and you see what changes, eventually you can figure out where the data is stored, and you can start working on cracking the encryption. Dude was doing that. So, and he'd actually figured out how to automate the job, because it's not that hard to automate a script that hits a website. And he changed a couple thousand dongles worth of serial numbers by the time we noticed. So while I am in the middle of trying to figure out what the hell's going on and how to stop them, because you know that's not going to be a two-second process, I created a quick and dirty trigger. This exact trigger, that actually runs live. Right now, it's been running live for eight, nine years now in our system. Every single time a dongle serial changes in our system, it adds a log entry. How big is this log table? A couple million rows. But it know, I know basically what the dongle and serial number was, what it is now. It's from that date. I can undo serial number changes. I can look for patterns in the serial numbers and realize, oh, these changes are invalid. Let's roll back these dongles so that our customers aren't broken. 
And eventually we started a little arms race. Me and the dude in the Netherlands kept coming out. Then he was coming out in Russia and then he was coming out in another country. And it's funny thing is he was coming out of countries where we don't sell any of our products. So it was not a problem banning entire countries. I mean, the Netherlands got banned. Well, we only had two customers in the Netherlands, so we didn't care. In the States, we got, th well, in the States, we got 28,000. Two, 20,000, two. Last time that they buy this, oh, 10 years ago, pff, don't care. Netherlands got banned. Russia got banned. China got banned. Thailand got banned. Vietnam got banned. Malaysia got banned. You're starting to see a pattern here, right? Saudi Arabia got banned. No, same reason. Uh, but they were in a connection that was so sketchy that it wasn't really a problem. <laughs> Only one in 10 transactions actually worked. Um, but, you know, so while I'm banning, happily banning countries, I was hardening the code so that it got a lot harder to execute this stuff. Now we're at the point where uh, it's not worth his effort anymore to try. But it took me six years of basically playing cat and mouse with them. This is what allowed me to fix the data every time he gets through the system. Oh, well, we're never going to find out who it was. We just banned the Netherlands. We've been in the Netherlands four times now. We've actually contacted their ISP, Ziggo, the major one, which they're not as proxy, and they told us to fuck off. Freedom of expression and speech. They're allowed to hit your site and hack it all they want. We said, okay, that's fine then. Banned. Actually, we banned just that ISP. <laughs> we found their entire subnet, banned them. Which 80% of the Netherlands traffic comes out of Ziggo, so you know. We haven't had any customers complain yet. Yeah, we banned an entire set of subnets. That was great. An entire C-class subnet, gone. So that's the joy of the triggers. It allowed me to maintain my data and keep it clean and keep track of what was going on while I was fighting. The other thing is, is this line right here, current query. That's a Postgres specific command. What it stores is what is the command that modified the data? Because I'm trying to figure out how this guy is hacking my data. So I got to go see what command he's running. Now I look at the command that's being running and I can go grep through all my code. For those of you that don't know what grep is, it's a basically a file search, file content search, looking for a part of that SQL statement. Oh, he's hitting this file. How the heck is he hitting this file? You shouldn't even be able to hit this file. Well then, we've got to move that file from there. And uh, yeah, we found all kinds of holes in our web server tanks, thanks to him. Our web servers have never been more secure. <laughs> yeah, nah, there's no way for us to know. We reported them to Ziggo, and the Ziggo said it's coming through our anonymous proxy, not our problem. Okay then, you're aiding and abetting a hacker. Uh, when he did come out in the States, that was funny though. He came out in the States three or four times, we contacted the FBI. And surprisingly, we got a letter within 20 minutes back and they'd already started contacting the ISPs to trace them. Uh, yeah. And considering we're just a small Canadian company, they're really big on the cyber terrorism bit. Because we pulled the cyber terrorism card. <laughs> so, you know, they're damaging product that's being sold in the US. And we have a US presence. We have two guys that work in the States. You know, so, all right. So that's today. Now, like I said, the assignment two is due tonight. You can go off after tonight. You have a week after tonight for the grace period. If you're willing to take a 10% hit off your grade, it's still possible to achieve a 90. Small chance, but it's still possible to achieve a 90. So it's not the end of the world if it's not finished today. You need to finish labs eight and nine. Otherwise you're gonna have a hell of a time with the practical exam. I'll be discussing the practical exam in class next week. Um, test two, oh yes. Hold on. I just wanna make sure test two is up. Thanks Dante. It's up. If you knew, why make me go look? <laughs> Test two is up and available. Knock yourselves out. You get one try. Test two. Midterm two.
next week. You have seven days.